Welcome to the Tribe of Testimonies. Here you will find conversations with faithful Native American members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, sharing their stories and their love of the Savior. My name's Andrea Hales. I'm Navajo, and I'm glad that you've decided to come and join us today. Hello. So today my guest is Betty LaFontaine. I met Betty on social media a while ago. A friend of mine mentioned her to me or something. And then I saw her posting on the indigenous and Native American members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Facebook page. And so I friended her. And I just, I just admire her. I admire Betty's willingness to, to share her testimony. Holy cow, is she, I think she's just amazing because she's able to do that. And I, um, was able to meet her in person for the first time this summer. They were out. I was so glad to talk to her. And then, I saw her again at the Book of Mormon videos, and that was so great. So, um, I've seen her in person, visited with her in person three times, and then we finally were able to schedule time to do the interview on the phone. I just love Betty. I just love her. I'm so grateful for her. I just really hope you enjoy this interview with her because I admire her so much. So here's Betty. I am on the phone today with my friend, Betty LaFontaine. She is uh, Navajo, Navajo, and she's in Florida. Um, Betty, would you introduce yourself more than just what I just did? <laughs> Good morning. Yeah, hey, I'm Betty LaFontaine. I live in uh, Orange Park, Florida, northern part of, of the state of Florida, border of Georgia. Um, living here for just about 31 years. We moved in 1989 as a young married couple, five children, um, and just not knowing where I was going, but my husband lived here before we met in Utah. So yeah, we've been here for 30 more or more years. That's so cool. Um, would you share something with us about your what you love about your heritage? It could be a story, ceremony, a way of life, a celebration, pretty much anything that you love, especially if it relates to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, you know, when you interview others, I think about, I, I ponder about the things that I, I just really hold dear to my heart with my culture. And that is the power of prayer. And I think when I was a, a child, my parents got us up very early in the morning at dawn, and we would run to the east direction, and we would um, pray as the sun was rising. And as we were running, we would um, my parents would point out things that we need to be aware of, our surroundings, the earth, the beautiful nature, things along the run, and just to be thinking and pondering about those things before we said our prayers and thank our Creator for those things. And I just, I just really love that um, that thing we did every morning, and it just reminded me of, of there was a God, and that, that you know we believe in Jesus Christ. It just really it just really meant a lot to me. Thank you. Well, actually, I have been thinking about that, that same uh, tradition. I've never got up and run with the sun. In fact, I hate running, period. But I've been <laughs> thinking about it. And um, I think one of the things that we've all just, whether or not we've ever heard of that, that tradition is we should get up and dedicate our lives to the sun 
not the sun that comes up in the sky, but the sun right. that has made all things. I've actually really been thinking about that a lot this week. So I'm really yeah. glad you brought that up today. I, I really um, appreciate that. Well, it, it's just when I talk to other people about what we believe in, I always point out that, that it, you, there's a good point that you brought up that um, it isn't the sun that we're praying to. It is the the creator who um, our our God and the son that's his son Jesus Christ who is the God of this this land. That's who we pray to, and I just really love that um, that tradition part of my my upbringing. My parents were very um, into traditions at an early age. Um, my mom went to the medicine man. My you know my dad too, and until they were uh, baptized, things change, but really not that much. You know what I mean? I mean, there's a lot of things that the native in the in the native world that go along with the gospel, and that's what I love about our culture. Yeah, yeah. So, what at what age did you get baptized? What number? What child were you in the rank of your family, and uh, when did the gospel come into your life? Um, there was 11 in my family, and so I was the middle child, and in my family, I, I don't know about other families, but in my culture, the middle child is a, is the one that who is the peacemaker, so um, that was a big responsibility as a middle child, but I liked it. I mean, I was the one that really said, all right, guys, come on, let's, let's get along kind of thing, you know, mm-hmm. never really thought of it as a chore. It just happened naturally, which was pretty cool. But um, yeah, my, my parents, my mom's story is, is quite um, touching. When she was eight years old, her parents, she, she lost her mom. So she, she didn't really know her dad. Um, and she started living with her her grandparents out on the reservation um, in Nyeezy. I don't know. Nyeezy is like by Farmington, out in the middle of nowhere. And she grew up there. After a while, she got to the age of um, teenage, you know, years. And her her grandparents who were raising her were getting kind of old and frail. And so the arrangements were made for her to be um, taken to her aunt, I believe, by clan in Crown Point. And uh, she said, every time I saw a car coming or a wagon coming or horses coming, I would hide. And so I go, why are you hiding? She goes, oh, well, I didn't want to go to no boarding school. I didn't want to go anywhere. I wanted to stay with my grandparents. And so uh, she said one night she heard uh, people come in the middle of the night. And she heard the wagon and the horses. And uh, her her grandparents came in and told her that she was going to go live with her um, aunt, clan aunt. And she's like, I didn't want to go. I cried and begged. I pled. She said, I got on that wagon. And she said it felt like I was out there forever and finally get to my to where I was supposed to be and, and it was a huge place they had a big ranch horses cows and you know all kinds of great things and she said they were pretty wealthy for a family like that and that that is pretty um amazing because there aren't very many people who have that now these days it's a kind of struggle but she she said it was a pretty nice place and she grew up there and she would herd the sheep and she would sit by the mesa and watch the sheep. She actually rode a horse then too. And she said, I saw these two men, these two Villaganas, she said, Villaganas is white men. She saw them out on these horses in a white shirt. And she said, I just, you know, I was kind of told not to talk to anybody. So I kind of shied away from, um, not kind of fearful, but, you know, I had that little fear in me. And she said, um, 
they would come closer and closer every other day. They'd come through there and they'd wave. And since I finally got, you know, the nerve enough to raise my arm and wave once in a while. And she said as they came closer and closer, one day they came right there in front of me. And she says, he, one of the Bilaganas opened his mouth and started talking to me in Navajo. And she says, I was just like, what is he? <laughs> What the heck? (laughs) (laughs) How does he know Navajo? And then uh, he showed her this book. I don't know if you've ever seen a Book of Mormon with the the blue one with the gold statue of Moroni on it. Yeah. Yeah. He showed her that and he said, I come to um, tell you about your people in this book. And she said, I looked at it, and they were telling me Navajo. And she said, I looked at it, and she says, as soon as I looked at that book, she said, I felt the spirit. I felt the warm feeling come over me. And she says, I just really thought that this was something special. But her um, her cousins who were on horseback, too, herding sheep, they told on me, she said, because you know, that she said hi to them or whatever she was talking to them. So her her clan aunt told her no more, you know, don't you can't those guys, you don't trust them, you don't talk to them. So she stopped and she said, But I'll never forget that that blue book. She said, I just really felt a connection right away with that. The spirit of that book was really it spoke to me, she said. So like make long story short <laughs> My father uh, met my mother kind of in an arrangement because back then they did arranged marriages. Yeah. And uh, they got married. She she was only like 17, I believe. She got married. And then my father and her got together. And then they um, lived for a little while in in a different area. And then uh, my dad needed a, a better job. So... Out back then, California was the place that all the some of the natives were going to uh, work in the fields and work in factories. So my dad moved moved the family out there. She had about I think three kids by then, and they moved to California. And that's where I was born. I was born in California, and uh, she made good friends with this Mexican lady, and the Mexican lady didn't speak English and my mother didn't speak English so I don't know how that happened but (laughs) they became really good friends they needed each other it sounds like yeah yeah she's like I don't know how we did it but we talked to each other and we understood each other and she said one day we were sitting outside our apartment and these two men in white shirts and ties were coming up sidewalk and she looked he says, my goodness, I've seen those guys before. <laughs> <You know? laughs> what are they doing here, you know? And so they came up to her and started talking to her friend and started talking Spanish to her. And she says, and they brought out that same book. And she says, I saw that book again. And she's like, oh, my goodness. This is something that I need to hear, you know? She just needed to hear it. And so they the men started, or the elders started talking to her too, and she didn't know English, but by then my brother, my oldest brother, who uh, was going to school and was reading well, and my sisters too, and they started reading this book. They left her a book, and they started reading this book to, to my mom, and my mom said, I learned the gospel by the spirit she says that took a Mormon spoke to me when I first saw it and it continued speaking to me through the through your mom your um, brother and your sisters and I learned the stories of the Book of Mormon through vision after they would read it to me they I would have dreams about about the Book of Mormon and the stories of those who came to this land and you know she said it was so familiar because the stories that have been told by her ancestors are is that we came from the east direction over the great waters and that um, there was disagreement between family members and some came this way and some stayed over in the east. So she said, when I heard that 
it sounds so familiar to me, it had to be true. You know, there she is talking about Lehi's family coming and uh, Raymond and Lemuel splitting. And, you know, it's just, <laughs> that's how she learned the gospel. And it's just been amazing since then, you know. After a while, they moved back to the reservation. I was born in California. And when I was four, I believe we moved back to the reservation. Wait, did did your did she join while she was in California? No, no, and that's what's amazing. She didn't until and um, then when I when we moved back, um, she started. Um, they moved back to the same place on the reservation, and <clears throat> she again was introduced again to the Book of Mormon and to the, in the church. And at that time, she wasn't doing the church. She was living, you know, wholeheartedly the traditions and the medicine man and everything. And um, they moved back to the reservation. And once again, the missionaries came out again and, and sought her out. And so her and, her and my dad, they, they liked it. They both wanted to join. And so I think they do, back then they herd them all together and they take them to the stake, uh, the stake, um, the steakhouse and in Gallup and they would um, do baptisms. And she was part of a group and they got baptized and she was baptized by LeGrand Richard. I don't know who, if you know who he is. Yeah, that's awesome. Isn't that crazy? I mean... <laughs> When I heard this story, I'm like, what? Yeah, she was baptized him, uh, by him. He was on, um, I don't think he was on a mission, but I think he was over the area. I'm not sure how that worked out and how he was there, but she got baptized by him. And she she, uh, she just really loved, loved the church. And she became very strong. And she, with her, you know, unable to speak English, not going to any to school at all she um became she became a relief society president she had that big calling i mean the stories about my mother are amazing i could i could tell you you could just sit here all day and listen to this, her stories because the spirit really really worked with her and was constantly with her and um teaching her and and that's what she said she told me um before she passed away she says never let let um, your beliefs go. Always stand for what you believe in. And God will always take care of you. He will always be there. He will always listen to your, your pleas. Please, when you need things, he says, she says, the Spirit will always be close to you. He'll take care of you. And I've always thought that was so such good wisdom. And I just really think I thank Heavenly Father for having such a strong mother like that. My father was pretty strong too, but he he battled with alcoholism as some of the natives do on on the reservation, and it's a really hard thing. But he battled through it, and eventually, that's how he was killed and 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 died not too in the nineties, ninety eight, I think, is when he passed away. I'm not sure. But, um, yeah. So, fast forward to your life. Have you always been a strong member of the church? Yeah, when you're, when you're taught to be, um, it's almost like work, walking in two worlds. Because I, I respect my Native culture. I respect how the people are even today. You know, I really look up to them. And we are taught um, to be that way. We are brought up to respect our elders, respect those who can't take care of themselves, and respect the culture. And I've always done that. And it's really um, kind of balanced it out together, you know, Mm -hmm. gospel and and my culture. And um, I was baptized at age 10. When the Indian placement, the Indian student placement program came in, my older siblings went on that program. And for a long time, there was like 
six older, no, five older and five younger. And so I was like in the middle. The five older ones participated in the program for a while. And they even went to, a couple of them went to BYU. One served a mission. And I saw that the way that they would, because nine months out of the year, you're at in Utah or, or any other place. They had um, California. They had Arizona. I think they even had Colorado and Utah that participated in that program. The families did. And so um, nine months, you go to school up there, and then you come home. And so that was kind of a hard thing after a while for them because they were gone most of the time. And I was home with all the other kids because I was taking care of them and helping with my with my siblings, my younger siblings. And uh, we just, you know, they balanced it pretty good, my older siblings, and they came back. And I noticed how they were changing a little bit, you know, because we spoke Navajo all the time. And then when they come home, they weren't speaking as much as we were. But um, we could understand, of course, because we went to public school. And so I I saw that I, I felt like I wanted to go. And for a long time, I would bother my parents. I want to go. I want to go. And they would say, no, no, it's not time. So finally, when I was 10, um, they said, you can go. And so you have to be baptized. And that's when I was baptized. And it it was kind of nerve-wracking because I thought, oh, am I going to be okay? Where am I going? Because you don't know where you're going. You don't know who you're going to live with. You've never met them. You just know you're going to go for nine months and you need to come home. So It's your first official mission. Yeah. <laughs> and you can say that. I never really looked at it that way. But, yeah. Um, so, when I, okay, when I was 10, I went, signed up. And I'll never forget that day, the bus came, this huge bus, and we met at the church. Our parents were dropping us off, and I only had like a little, little tiny suitcase with, with you know, the bare necessities. Because you have to understand, I grew up in a home that had no electricity, no running water, no bathroom, nothing fancy at all. You literally only did have the bare necessities. Yeah, a dirt floor, you know, it, very humble, very humble beginning. And um, so got on that bus and I'll never forget my mom's face, not a, not a teardrop, so strong. And just waving at us, you know, me and my little sister went and saying goodbye. And I thought to myself, how could, now I think about it. I look at my, I hold my grandkids in my arms and they're nine and 10 years old. And I'm thinking, how could my mom have done it? How did she do it? You know? And uh, I'll never forget, I got to my first place and uh, picked up by a family and my first area was Eureka, Utah. Have you heard of Eureka, Utah? Yeah. <laughs> it's just a little, little uh, ghost town. Things yeah. Like up in the mountains and you know I come from flat country and then we go up into these mountains. I felt like they were going to choke me but get my uh, meet my foster family, the Garbit. He was a bishop. He owned a country western band and in that little mining town, everybody knew everybody, you know, everybody knew what was going on. So I get up to that family and we get up there. They took me shopping and bought me a new wardrobe. I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> and uh, we went to their home and walked into the house and it was just like, wow, look at this place, you know. I, I've never seen a place like that. It, you have to you have to understand. I came from nothing, and here's this beautiful home. You know, it had a it had a upstairs, and that's where we slept was in upstairs. And I'll never forget the first night she we said prayer, and they gave me the pajamas to put on. I never wore pajamas in my life. <laughs> I was, I was told to put these on, so I put my pajamas on. I get upstairs, and she 
she tucked me in bed and then she, uh, we, well, we pray and then tucks me in bed and then she puts down, you know, puts her face down in my face and gives me a kiss on my head and I thought, what the heck is she doing, <laughs> you know? <laughs> what is going on? So, but I thought, okay, um, that's fine. And, and so for the next 30 days, I wake up on the floor. <laughs> I was used to sleeping on my sheepskin rug on the floor with five other kids, you know, sleeping on the floor. And that's what I was used to for 30 days. I woke up on the floor and I could hear her whispering to the family, she, she's sleeping on the floor again. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> but it was a, I mean, and, and I could see the change in myself each year I went back. Um, I had friends before I left. I had a few friends. And then each time I came back, I had fewer friends. And I always wondered why. And my mom would tell me, don't worry about it. They're seeing the change in you. I said, well, I'm not changing that much. Yeah, you're changing. But it's okay. You're changing for the good. She's like... But all you have to do is you have to love them and let them let them be their way. But you love them and you respect them. And you always, always tell them that you're, you know, be a good example to them. And, and they'll honor you. Don't worry about it. I thought that was such wise words from her all the time. She used to talk like that. And it was just, it's just something that has stuck in my mind that I need to be loving to everyone and that I just need to show 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 the love that I have for, for mankind and that's just always stuck in my mind yeah. but I love the placement program I, I love what it did for me and I know there's probably some that have had negative experiences and you know but I didn't I had positive uh, experiences I learned how to hunt my foster dad taught me how to hunt. He used to take me up in the mountains and we'd hunt deer. I shot my first deer when I was um, that first year, 10, 10 years old, two, um, two months into it. I think it was um, hunting season and I shot my first deer and, I, and he showed me how to gut a deer and everything. And I think out of all the foster dads, I lived with three four different families and uh, out of each of those families I was closest to my dad and I think because of the I didn't have that closeness with my own mm. biological father yeah because of his um, alcoholism and so with the foster dads I really had a good connection and they really fathered me very well and I'm thankful for that but the family unit it's really no different because the family unit and on the reservation family is very very important I mean we celebrate everything um at being a, a native we celebrate everything every accomplishment you know and and family is very very important to each of us yeah so um, how did you meet your husband, Mike? Um, <clears throat> okay, I, this is interesting. <laughs> My, <laughs> every summer I go home, I'm getting older and older. And, you know, the first year I went up, um, I wore glasses and, you know, those, um, I don't know if you've seen them, they, they look like, uh, had eyes glasses yeah I used to wear those I was just this little humble little red girl and had long hair and I was pretty athletic and I was more so of a tomboy type person yeah and um <clears throat> so every year I went up I just started changing and that's part of the change that was happening my mom says you're growing into a flower and I'm like mom like, well, you are. You're becoming a young lady. 
guys will notice you more. I said, well, I don't want that happening. Like, <laughs> it, you can't help it. It'll happen. I said, be okay. So I was changing. That part of me was really changed. Outwardness of me was changing. I was becoming this young woman. And uh, we met, my husband and I met at um, at a seminary uh, volleyball activity thing. He moved from Florida about, um, I think, a year before I met him. And he... Uh, <clears throat> He, my husband's name is Mike, and he's his dad is half Chippewa, and so he's a quarter, and he's half, and the rest is Swede from Sweden. La Fontaine comes from the French part. My his father was French Canadian Chippewa, <clears throat> and uh, he grew up in uh, where did he grew up in Oh Turtle Mountain Reservation his uh, father and that's in Minnesota or North Dakota somewhere up there and so they didn't really he left the reservation his father left the reservation when he was real young and joined the military and met Mike's mom in St. Paul Minnesota and they had their first child and then when Mike was born they moved down to Florida where he had to um as part of the military, he worked on ships. So there's a big military. This is a big military town here. So he worked out of here. And then later on, when Mike became a teenager, things were getting a little rough in inner city. So here in Florida, he wanted to move his family out to Colorado. And then they ended up in Utah in better schools and better environment, is what he said. And Mike came to my high school. And we met at a seminary activity and it just went from there I mean we had married in I think 78 we were both 18 very young we got married and started having children we was in Utah for about five years and then Mike he never liked the winter always hated the winter there in Utah the summer's are here are really hot, but he liked the winters here. So we moved here. I wasn't excited about it, but we we ended up here and started raising our family. But I thought that one day that I would marry my my goals were to marry somebody who held the priesthood, who was worthy to hold the hold the priesthood, who served the mission who um, wanted to bring their family up in, in the gospel. And Mike didn't serve a mission, but he called me his mission. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so uh, we have five children, and today we have 24 grandchildren. Aww. So we love the gospel, and we just we just totally enjoy that our children accept the gospel, too. I mean... Um, and I think it's such an important part of family is to have that that um, testimony, that firm testimony of, of Jesus Christ and of the Book of Mormon, and that we have a prophet today that leads us, and that we as a people really need to ponder and pray about the words, especially since General Conference was just, you know, we just listened and we were so blessed to, to hear our our. Our leaders speak to us, and I'm thankful for that. I'm especially thankful for a strong family unit. And that, as Native people, we're we're taught that family is very, very important. That we should always put family first, and we should always help each other, no matter how distant distant we are. I just got a call the other day about one of my uncles that passed away. And, how the family is just coming together and I'm out here in, in Florida and all I could do is send send money to help with everything but they always come together it doesn't matter I mean we always help each other in some way or another but and I'm so thankful for prayer I was telling you a little bit about my um my battle with COVID yeah I was a year ago I 
yeah, it was a year ago in the last couple of days that I came came home from the hospital. I was there almost five weeks and nearly lost my life. And I was so thankful for it. It was five weeks? Five weeks I was in the hospital. It was it was quite the battle. I mean, I I didn't go in thinking, well, this was going to be my last place I was going to be, you know, but it came close to it. <laughs> but, <clears throat> but the power of, of prayer, I just, you know, it's just so important to stay close to our Heavenly Father. And we don't know when, you know, when we're going to need him like right now you know when I was in there I just I I read a lot and I listened to a lot of music and um listened to some talks and I could I could feel the room with I filled the room with the spirit and I think that's what really helped me I'm sorry I'm gonna get a little emotional but you know you really don't know what you have until you're you're laying there on the bed and you're you're asking Heavenly Father for literally your life to step in, you know. And I did that one night, one night in two o'clock in the morning. I asked him, and I finally said to myself and to him, I said, Heavenly Father, if it's time for me to go. And you want me to come home? I will. I will come. I'm ready. I'm ready to come. And if you would just take care of my family, and you know, take care of my husband and my special little girl, my special niece and daughter, if you will take care of them, then I am at peace. I will come home. And <clears throat> then a miracle happened after that. After that, I started getting better. But I think Heavenly Father expects us to come to Him to just let everything go and just say, Hey, you know, it's in your hands. Take it from me. And He will. He'll take it from you. And I am so thankful for, for Him in my life and for my Savior, Jesus Christ. I love the message of truth. And the message of truth is found in the Book of Mormon. There's so much in there that we can live by each day. I mean, we can almost anywhere in the Book of Mormon find there is hope and peace and love of our Savior Jesus Christ. And so I'm so thankful for for that in my testimony. It isn't firm, but it is pretty good. I mean, I can stand up for what I believe, and I. I would do whatever I could to stand up for that belief in my life. Yeah. Um, you you said you live in Florida. How big is your city, and how many other natives do you know there in the city? Well, our city is pretty big. Um, I don't know. It's it's, it's one of the biggest cities. My acreage wise in the United States. <laughs> um, yeah. And then we live in a sur- suburb next to it um, in Orange Park. And as far as native, no, hardly any. I, I think there of one other Navajo right now that I can think of that lives in Tallahassee. And uh, not too many natives. Uh, down south, Seminole, Seminole Nation is there. And the uh, Miccosukee Nation is down south, which I worked with the with the with the Seminole Nation and the Miccosukees before at FSU. Um, but they're great people, and we live in in the swamp area of um, down south. Um, I just wondered, you just bore strong testimony of the Book of Mormon. Have you have you ever been able to share that strong testimony with any uh other Native Americans that have not heard of our our beliefs and this this gift that we've been given? I do. I 
every chance I get, I get, I, I try to do that. You know, I have a, made some pretty good friends from participating at the activities at FSU. I taught a culture class there and uh, taught some crafting and things like that. And, and all the kids, they always know that I'm LDS. I, that's one thing that as missionaries that we should do is, is, is sharing the gospel. We should always make it known that we're part of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and that we we are um, we are faith Christians. And I live in the South. And a lot of people are Baptists and whatnot here. And the, it's the Bible Belt and they truly believe in the, in the Bible, which is great. I love the Bible too. And but I also love the Book of Mormon. And so when you talk to someone, and when I have talked to people here, other natives, I always stress that that's who I am and that's what, what I believe. And, and that um, I love the Bible, but here's another testament of Jesus Christ who came here to this country. And this is a story about the people. And this is a story about your people, our people. These are them. And this is this is who we are. And we are chosen. And we are we have a mission. And this will gl- draw you close to our Savior Jesus Christ. You know, I have done that as much as I can to other Native people. Even when I go to the powwows, I have a Book of Mormon that sometimes I can give away. I do it, and I think even more now because I was um, I was at the mercy of my my savior that night, and I want to share it. I have to. I mean, I feel like I owe him. I'm getting a little emotional again. I do owe him. I owe him, and I need to. I need to let everybody know what I have is not a secret. But that it is a sacred thing and that I need to share it. And um, I just feel obligated to, and I'm willing to do that every day if I have to. Thank you. Oh, there's, there's so many other things, but uh, okay, let's, let's do one more thing and then we'll do the last question. So okay. tell me about your favorite things about being part of the Book of Mormon videos, the live videos for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. You've been in more oh. than more than one season, so tell us tell us some of the your favorite things about those experiences. Oh my gosh. That I was in season three with King of the Moni and um, the spirit was so strong. I mean, and what was so awesome was that I was with my brothers and sisters, not just Native brothers and sisters, but all Lamanites were all together, and we all had commonality. We we all believe the church is true. We all have the Book of Mormon. We've all read it. We've all been studied it. We were we were one. It was just, that was amazing. We were all one. And we were all there because we wanted to be there. And the spirit was there the whole time. I mean, and the, the people who were who were acting, you could tell that they were there because they wanted to be there. And it was just amazing. King Ramoni was just the, the whole thing, the whole first part of it. And we made such good friends. I made good friends with people, long life friends, I believe, that I had made through participating in, in King Lamoni. And then this last one with Christ in America. Oh my goodness. There were times where I I thought I was really there and that I was truly there when Christ came. And that being in the presence of, of Christ, he was an actor, but he really uh, portrayed Christ so well, and you will not, you won't, you won't believe the, the spirit, how strong it was. You had to be there. I know you were, Andrea, and the spirit was so strong, and everybody was so happy, and 
I just pictured it in my mind. It, it's going to happen again, and this is how it'll be when Christ comes again. And um, we just need to prepare ourselves. I the whole time, as I was, as we were in the midst of of the actor Christ, and we were in this, um, as Lane and I was sitting there and, and uh, watching him and, and participating in that that footage of Christ in America and how he was preaching to us and how he was um, walking amongst us and even um, talking to us so close at times. And there's a scene where I, he was right there in front of me and I just, I did lost it because I just felt the spirit so strong. As I was participating in this, the whole time I was thinking, what can I do? What can I do different? to make my life better? How can I be a better minister and walk amongst my brothers and sisters? What can I change to be better? And how can I do it? And I was going through this in my mind the whole time it was there because I think the Spirit was talking to me and encouraged me to do better, to be a better person, to be a better minister and to love better and look beyond the color and everything. I think I've always done that. I've never really looked at anybody as, hey, you're black or, hey, you're Mexican or, hey, you're this, because I was taught by a wonderful mom who said there was no no other color because we were all his children. And so... As I sat there, I thought to myself, okay, and that was the one big thing I learned was that I was there, I saw Christ, and I felt his spirit, and I knew that I needed devoted more time for him and to prepare others and myself and my family, especially, for his coming because he is coming, and when he does come, we need to know who he is. We need to know him. We need to have that relationship with him. And so we, as brothers and sisters of this land, no matter who we are, Mormon, LDS, and whatever we go by, Latter-day Saint, Christian, non-Christian, we need to know him. We need to prepare ourselves because he will return. I think that brings us right back to the beginning of of our interview here where if we run towards the sun every morning mm-hmm. he, he will lighten our day yeah. and give us direction yeah and that brings peace to me every day and I'm thankful for that yeah. okay Let's quit crying unless you have more cry unless you have more tears when you answer this last question. <laughs> oh. What does it mean to you to know that you belong to the tribe of Israel? Oh my gosh. I shout if I could stand on a wall like Samuel the Lamanite. I would do it. Because I know who I am, and I know where I came from, and I know that the the people of Israel are special, and that we, as uh, the people, need to know it. We, our people, need to know it. If it's not one thing, two things: it's being a child of God and being chosen and part of Israel. Those two things. If we can come to know those things as people, as Native people, we <clears throat> we won't have it made, but we will think on our lives more um, more important in that we will develop the love of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it, that will be um, stronger, I believe. So, yeah, it, it brings me joy to know I am of the branch of Israel, of the house of Israel. It tells me and my patriarchal blessing. And uh, it's just, it's just part of my blood. I know, I know I'm, 
they're part of that house, and I'm thankful for that. Thank you, Betty. Thank you. I love you. I'm so glad that I I know you not just on the phone and not just on Facebook, but in life in in real life that I could hug you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm thankful that you have this wonderful podcast, and I'm so grateful that you started it and and that these brothers and sisters from this country and Canada, wherever they may be from, are just jumping on board and calling you and asking you to to talk about their testimonies. I'm thankful for that, that you're you're doing that and I'm so thankful for them. And you know, when I hear their testimonies, it strengthens mine. Yeah. And it makes me thankful that, you know, we as the health of Israel are gonna stand and we will see our Savior when he returns. And we'll be there at the New Jerusalem, and we will be a part of that, and we will be called upon to be a part of that. And this is a part of that, that um, house of visit gathering that you're doing right now, and I'm thankful that you are doing it. And yes, I'm grateful to, to be your friend too, Andrea. Thank you for doing this podcast. Thank you. Today is Indigenous Peoples Day, and I'm so grateful for my ancestors. I am thankful for them, and I hope that all of you who are listening are grateful for your ancestors, whatever color they may be in. I hope that you know Heavenly Father brought you to this place that you are now. And that happens only because of our ancestors. A couple of my friends and I are... We're going to work on a project for all of you. It won't just be me. It'll be a group effort. And I hope that as details start coming out that you'll support us kind of excited about it. I'm not going to tell you all of it right now, but I think I think it'll be really good for any of you who read social media. My I have shared that my oldest brother is in the hospital with COVID. He's now he's just recovering from the COVID and it has just wreaked havoc in his lungs and he He's not well because his lungs are not well. So he's in my prayers and I appreciate any prayers that are offered in his behalf. I hope that your hearts are turned toward the Savior. I hope that you're paying attention to the tender mercies that he sends. Because he does send them. I hope your day is beautiful. I hope that you have loved ones. I hope that you are trying to share your love with someone else. And I hope you're having a super wonderful, awesome day. Tribe of Testimonies is not affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The music is a traditional hymn, Come Thou Found of Every Blessing, arranged and performed by Kyle Forsyth. If you know someone who might be interested in being a guest, please reach out to me at tribeoftestimonies at gmail.com.